Welcome to the DrupalCon Portland Nonprofit Summit. <laughs> we are thrilled to have a full house today. If you did not already check in at the registration, please let them know that you've arrived at the break. Thank you. Thank you for your commitment to Drupal, to the Drupal community, and of course to your own missions or in support of the sector. You are making the world a better place, and I truly, truly mean that from the bottom of my heart. My name is Julia Kranzthor, and I work for the Drupal Association as the Director of Philanthropy. Please know we are here to support all your needs. Come find a staff member if you need help, and I encourage you to take photos and share them with us, but please respect our photo policy. And first, we'll start with an overview of what to expect for today. Following this morning's fireside chat and a quick break, we will listen to a 15-minute case study presented by Sandstorm, our event, our event sponsor. Thank you, Sandstorm. Then we will break out into hosted discussions with community members at the tables. Choose the topic you would like to attend, displayed on the screen at that time, and feel free to hop around. This is very informal. We will break for lunch and then do it all over again, but in reverse order with new breakout hosted discussion topics. And finally, we will be joined by members of the Drupal Association's engineering team to discuss the D10 upgrade, a group session affectionately called the Can of Worms. <laughs> At the Drupal Association, our mission is to drive innovation and adoption of Drupal as a high-impact digital public good, hand-in-hand -hand with our open source community. Our vision is for the web to be innovative, inclusive, and open. As the Director of Philanthropy, I was brought on to the DA last summer to build a culture of philanthropy. The concept of a culture of philanthropy signifies a shift in how we engage with our community, donors, and stakeholders. It underscores the understanding that philanthropy is not just the responsible of a select few within the organization, but a shared commitment that permeates every facet of our or operations. To achieve this, I need to engage with donors who have common values and goals, build a more transparent and inclusive sustaining donor program. Some of you folks learned about that at the membership breakfast yesterday. Take a leadership role in open source advocacy, manage philanthropic funding within the open source community, and secure funding outside the Drupal ecosystem for overlapping priorities that allow Drupal to thrive, such as environmental sustainability, good jobs in tech, especially for folks ba uh, facing barriers to entry, advocacy for open source, and advocacy for open web. Lastly, I want to celebrate and amplify the missions of nonprofits using Drupal. The nonprofit sector is fundamentally important to the Drupal community as a reflection of open source values and community sourced problem solving. Drupal is not just a fax machine. I might have to get a more updated reference. No. <laughs> It is a component of your organizations, a way to innovate, a way to serve your mission, a way to, become, to drive the strategy to achieve your mission. We want to support you, the, non the nonprofit Drupal community, and everything that you set out to achieve. To begin communicating all of these benchmarks to new and existing stakeholders, we are launching a Drupal Association website this summer making improvements to the Drupal Association newsletter and social media channels, and evolving our approach to donor engagement, moving away from a transactional sponsorship model towards a more inclusive, transparent, and community-based approach to individual giving. Thank you again to Sandstorm, and thank you for being here. We are going to loosen up just a little bit before we begin the fireside chat and also feel out the, who is in the room, which will help our chat moderators drive the content for their conversations. So, turn to someone next to you and introduce yourself. Very quickly. <laughs> That's how they roll, man. Yep. 
Nobody's shy here. <laughs> Cecilia's not here. Is she? I don't see her. No. Okay. Her, her she I told me she was coming. Okay, so please, we encourage you to continue talking throughout the day, switch tables, introduce each other to a new friend, but now we're going to do a little bit uh, of wayfinding in the room. If you settle down, class. If settle you down. So, with a show of hands, you can stand up if you'd like, or you can just give a little shout or a wave. Who came from the East Coast? Wow, lots. Tired. Midwest? <laughs> that dirty, dirty South? Oh, yeah. The West Coast? You are already here. <laughs> Awake. From outside the U.S.? All right. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you for making the trip. Who's at an organization smaller than 15 people? Woo. Bigger than 50. In between? Who is in higher education today? <laughs> Thanks for coming to our summit. <laughs> <laughs> Who is new to the Drupal community? Welcome. 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 Who's a developer? Hi. Who's a Drupal user, but you don't write code? Yes. Who represents an agency looking to build Drupal sites for nonprofits? Who is a Drupalist for a nonprofit? Who is the only Drupalist at their organization? Hats off. Lonely only. And who is ready to get rocking and rolling and start the fireside chat? I'm pleased to introduce Tim Lennon, CFO from the Drupal Association, Johanna Bates from CTO. Dev CTO. Oh, CTO. Sorry, buddy. <laughs> Johanna Bates from the Dev Collaboratives and community organizer for today's summit, and Jess Snyder from WETA and the other community organizer for today's summit. And to set the mood. Yeah, we have a fire. We have fire. It's a little much, actually, to be honest. <laughs> yeah, can you mute? Can you mute it? We definitely don't need, like, we could, yeah. <laughs> I like to, if you, I was getting warm, actually. Yeah, yeah, yeah. If, if this is, if this movement of this fire bothers anyone, um, let us know. We can, we can pause it. Um, do, do you want, do you want me to go first, or? Yeah. Okay. Um, so. Uh, Mic microphone, just sorry. Oh, should I, should I talk into it, it? Just pull it closer. Okay, I will do that. Sorry. So my name is Johanna Bates. Um, I am co-founder and co-owner of Dev Collaborative. We build websites about two-thirds in Drupal, one-third in WordPress for nonprofits and higher ed. Um, and uh, we are 
a uh, intentionally sized as small, about 10 people, consultative um, agency that uh, is co-owned, is, is uh, woman and LGBT co-owned and led. And um, I got there um, via working with and for and in nonprofits myself. Um, I've been a developer for 25 years in and with and for nonprofits. And I don't write code anymore because <laughs> uh, I'm running Dev Collaborative, but um, I have been using Drupal for 20 years since version 4.7, which I think was out 2004. And um, I have been really drawn to this community for my whole career. The intersection of, uh, you know, technology, nonprofits, and open source feels like home to me. And I think that's in part because there's so much space for learning and there's peer support. There's way more diversity, um, I've found, than in other places in technology. So someone like me um, feels more comfortable. Mm -hmm. And I basically have gotten everything in my career from the people in these communities. I would not be here without this kind of space. Um, I started running nonprofit summits at Nice Camp in New York City years ago, and then the Drupal Association asked me to bring them to DrupalCon. I did a couple of those. Um, then they stopped asking, and <laughs> I was like, okay, I guess I'm retired. And then the pandemic happened, and I was like, good luck, everyone. I st we still run a, a call for um, N10, the Nonprofit Technology Network, every month, where lots of, so many people in this room um, regularly attend that call. And there are cards on the table if you ever want to join us. It's totally chill and informal, one hour free. Um, talk about Drupal, like whatever level you're at. So I've been, I st I've stayed in the community, but the DA, um, I think they realized that there's been some loss of nonprofit folks from the Drupal project and community. And they were like, will you run a summit again? I was like, no. And, um, <laughs> and then, um, enter Julia, who has been absolutely champing, um, making this a better place for nonprofits to um, use Drupal. And cheaper. And cheaper, <laughs> yes. Thank you, Julia. So if it wasn't for Julia and then Jess, who is a co-moderator for my end time group and my partner in crime and many things in this space, were like, we'll do it, let's do it. And I was like, no, and then we did it. And it was very last minute, which, which is, and next year it's gonna be more, um, it's gonna have a lot more structure and um, some cool things that Julia has in mind. But this year, we just really want to, to the, the goals of these summits are always really networking and um, learning and feeling supported because a lot of us are self-taught. I mean, I don't know about you all, but I know some people have formal education in web development but even then, many of us have worn, wear multiple hats. For a long time, I was a combination webmaster and lead grant writer, right? I did that for like eight years. Like, what? how did those go together? Don't know. Um, so, so yeah, I think that beyond this day, the connections you make here, um, you'll find people in Drupal Slack, you'll find people on N10 calls, you'll find people at other conferences. Um, you, we want you to have other people that you can go to when you're like, how do I get this done in Drupal? My org wants to throw it over. Um, and some of the things we're gonna talk about today is why Drupal is still important and why open source is so important to nonprofits because, and to the nonprofit sector because a lot of us have to make those arguments internally to our, to our boards, to our our bosses to our stakeholders about like why are we taking this path? And that can be hard sometimes. Um, there's a lot of frustrations with Drupal right now. Maybe, I don't know. And <laughs> um, <laughs> what we're gonna do is we have um, a parking lot. So as we talk, we're gonna have the, you know, we're, as we have our fireside chat, and it is cold in here, so I'm, I'm glad we have a fire. Um, we are going to take notes, but you can also put them up over here on this piece of paper for the can of worms discussion. We're not trying to squash negativity, but we, it's such a rabbit hole to talk about all the issues with Drupal 10 
and all the issues with Drupal right now. Um, so we want to kind of save that for the end of the day where we can really get into it. Um, so I think um, that is me, um, Jess, partner in crime Jess. Yes. Hi, I'm partner in crime Jess. <laughs> <laughs> Um, my name is Jess Snyder. I am uh, at WETA, which is the PBS and NPR station for Washington, D.C. Um, so I am in-house nonprofit staff person. Um, I am a lonely only. I am the Drupal developer. My fancy made-up nonprofit title is Director of Web Systems. Mm. Yeah. Um, <laughs> what does that mean? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> so, um, in, in the vein of the accidental techie, WETA hired me back in 2002 on the basis that I would learn HTML, <laughs> which I did. They she did. She yeah. Did. <laughs> they, they, they sent me to a two-day HTML class, and then about six months later, they sent me to a two-day PHP class. Here I am. <laughs> um, we started using Drupal in 2007. Drupal 5 was my first Drupal. So I missed the 4.7s. Um, I've built in five. We skipped six altogether. Went straight to seven. Now I'm happy to say all of my sites are on 10. Whew. Congratulations. Yes, thank you. Um, I'm just going to second everything Johanna said about sort of the goals and ambitions of today, um, the, the hope of bringing people together. Um, I know that I have found just tremendous resources and friends here in the nonprofit Drupal community, and I, and I just want to help pay that forward and help all of you make those same connections. Um, and I also want it on record that Johanna has agreed to do this next year. <laughs> <laughs> So um, I'll just pass it over to Tim to introduce himself. Awesome. Thank you very much, everybody. It's lovely to see you all here um, and to be in front of some familiar faces and some new faces. I am Tim Lennon, or Hestinet on Drupal.org is probably more likely the name you know me by. I'm the CTO of the Drupal Association. And we ourselves are, of course, a nonprofit. And so we use Drupal in the nonprofit space. Uh, we're a little bit of an unusual nonprofit um, in terms of being the, an open source software project nonprofit, but uh, we have some similar challenges of our own. Um, and when we ask later, you know, who's still on Drupal 7? I'm one of the ones who's going to raise my hand. So, um, you know, uh, I think it'll be an interesting conversation to, uh, to talk about those things. But in terms of my personal background, um, I grew up uh, in a family that has always been in the nonprofit space. So my first nonprofit job was like licking stamps for envelopes for a nickel a piece when I was like seven. Um, for, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Well, you know, at, at that age, I think I got through about four before I was completely bored. Um, <laughs> but anyway, um, yeah, and my, uh, my folks founded a microenterprise uh, development nonprofit that worked in Kenya, Uganda, Tanzania, and since their retirement has expanded to Congo, Rwanda, Ethiopia, and a number of other organizations. So I kind of grew up in the, uh, another number of other countries. Um, so I kind of grew up in a, like hearing the vocabulary of nonprofits from when I was very small and this whole organization was operating out of the garage uh, at my house um, and then have stayed in nonprofit careers just moving into the tech side of nonprofits ever since. So, you know, it's my goal to both talk about um, maybe some of the insights that I have about Drupal, its roadmap, its future, its current challenges, but also to listen uh, a little bit to uh, everything that you have to say and introduce some other folks throughout the day to um, talk to you about some important topics. So thanks very much, everyone. Okay. Is everyone okay with the fire? Is it too warm or? <laughs> okay. We were gonna have cocoa, but it's gonna be 80 today, so. Um. So yeah, so um, basically we, we're gonna chat a little bit about, um, I feel like it's a good time to remind ourselves, right, why, why open source is important um, and why Drupal is still a good option. Um, and you know, for those of you who have to sell this internally or sell this externally, either way, we're all, you know, and or just sell it to yourself, <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, this is part, this is really kind of just re reminding us all like why we're here and why, why we care and why we have a whole conference about this. Um, and um, uh, we are gonna have some 
Q&A time, but we're just going to chat with Tim a little bit about this stuff. And, you know, um, basically, Tim. Um, <laughs> Ooh, I'm on the spot. Good. <laughs> Tim, um, why is open source really a, a really good choice for the nonprofit sector in particular? Um, yeah, this is a good question, and there was a, a brief, glorious window when it seemed like the answer was obvious, and then it's gotten harder again. But um, I think, um, I'll give a pointed example that's hopefully not too political, but um, there's a lot of organizations that, I guess this first started maybe seven, eight years ago, transferred all of their fundraising activities to their Facebook pages, right? They moved everything over to this platform, they encouraged all of their constituents to uh, follow them there. This was like, you know, where everyone is present. This is the zeitgeist of uh, engagement and interaction. And then, you know, Facebook, now Meta, made the decision to say, oh, by the way, we'll no longer publish your updates to all the followers of your pages unless you pay for a boost. Um, whoops, we locked in all of your audience to our proprietary platform, and then we bait and switched you and made you start paying for it. Um, then, you know, we start talking about other kinds of publishing systems that have come into place, and you have everything from the, well, what I call the Squixes, the Squarespaces and the Wixes on the very low end, um, all the way up to these enterprise-grade platforms, and they aren't built for you or for me. Um, they are built to support, um, you know, on the high-end enterprise scale, they're, they're built to kind of a uh, roadmap for um, enterprise organizations, and on the low end scale, they're built for the like, hey, we want to capture the the Etsy shop owner type equivalents. Nobody's out there saying we're going to make the best constituent management tool, we're going to make the best community engagement tool, we're going to make the best civic engagement tool, because frankly, that's not where the money is. And a free and open source platform has the opportunity to let you be in control of the platform you build. Um, and that's the fundamental reason why open source is a good idea, but I think there's a lot of specifics um, that we can talk about as well as we get into it a little further, so. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I, I feel like from, from the nonprofit staff person perspective, I think a lot of the times we tend to go towards open source because it's free. Um, air quotes around the free because free you, like a puppy. Yeah, yeah, because there there is um, a lot of sweat equity involved um, at, at the very least, uh, if not some specialized skills. So um, you know, sort of drilling down from the sort of the larger why open source? Why is Drupal awesome for nonprofits? <laughs> yeah, this is a. I mean, this is a particular. Um, uh, you know, it's it's the zooming in question, right? So part of it is, um, and this could apply to other open source communities, but part of it is that we collaborate together on uh, solutions that apply across uh, nonprofits within open source and within Drupal. And um, Drupal has some unique benefits compared to most or even all other open source or, or proprietary systems in terms of starting to get into the nerdy technical stuff in terms of um, structured data, reusability, being able to use Drupal as kind of the fundamental content store of um, multiple kinds of campaigns that you run, not just in your web channel, but maybe connected to social media, but not owned by a social media company, right? Aggregated through those things. Um, maybe connected to uh, channels that are not the traditional web anymore, uh, particularly if you're working in some form of international nonprofit, or even if you're working in a sort of boots on the ground nonprofit environment, you might be serving your like, you know, your your iPad tablet um, uh, engagement stuff out of a, a centralized uh, Drupal database. That's not both your marketing operation, your constituent engagement, your CRM, all of these things. And Drupal, between you know the huge ecosystem of modules around it and just kind of the fundamental um, uh, soundness of the data structures is really well built for that. So um, yeah, I'll try to avoid going too deep on the tech side, but I think it's really important to think that you're getting, you're operating from a system that will be extensible to the future of your organization when you go from a $500,000 budget to a half million dollar budget to a $10 million budget or more, depending on how you scale and what the, the scope of your mission is, so. I have a question, Tim. Tim, 
Why can't we just all build WordPress sites, Tim? Uh, well, we could, <laughs> if you like. Um, we, we could build WordPress sites. Um, I don't know if a uh, WordPress site is uh, everything you want. I mean, if you want. Why not, Tim? <laughs> um, well, well, it depends, right? So I'm not going to sell them short. I have, I have some good friends over there. But, um, you know, if you are doing more than just presenting, well, let's put it this way. If you still think of your digital presence, as being equivalent to the flyer you have when you're on a conference floor, then go for it. Um, that's fine. The digital brochure version of your web presence, like if that's the kind of the extent of your engagement. But if what the if if you view and understand, and if you're in this room, I'm sure you do, that kind of the future of your nonprofit engagement, or really the present of your nonprofit engagement, is digital, and then that and that that experience should be data-driven and interactive and not a kind of one-way communication platform, then I think you need something um, that can accommodate that. And I think Drupal's the right tool for the job. But Tim, <laughs> there's so many plugins. Oh, and God. the editing experience is really great. Yeah, um, OK, we can talk about plugins. <laughs> We can talk about uh, the software architecture of those plugins. We can talk about how in 2000, 2019, how my Drupal security team was DDoSed by a bunch of zombie Drupal sites that had an insecure mail sending plugin that they had all installed. And someone used it to coordinate an attack when Drupal was about to post a security release to try and like, I don't know, it was, a, it was an attempt at like a human DDoS. So, so I got 10,000 emails an hour while we were in this release window and I'm actually still unsubscribing from some of this <laughs> um, okay. like 10 years later. Um, that's not to say that there isn't well-built, highly secure, well-managed things, but there's a posture in the Drupal ecosystem about the way we do interoperability, the way we do the architecture of the extensions that we do, the, the posture of our security team, uh, all of these things that is on a different level. Um, I think it's on, particularly if you're in a regulated industry, um, it is much, much easier to find within the Drupal space um, tools and systems that meet certain compliance standards or can be adapted to meet certain compliance standards than it is with some of these other projects. Um, now, editorial experience is an interesting question <laughs> because that has been hard and it's actually gotten harder uh, is since, let's say, 20, maybe since 2016. Um, it's actually gotten harder in some ways. But I think one of the things you're seeing, especially on stage on Monday, if you made it to the keynote, um, we'll talk more about Starshot later, but this, um, the concept behind Starshot, I think there's been a lot of confusion here, was that like, is it a fork of Drupal? Am I gonna migrate again? Is there a new upgrade path that's incompatible? It's none of those things. It's the idea of aggregating together Drupal with what only the insiders really knew were the extra things you needed to make Drupal work. Drupal is never something you could use just with core. There's a key set of modules that like make Layout Builder better or that make um, uh, workflows more functional for your editorial staff or allow you to designate workspaces. Like some of this stuff has gotten into core, but it's always been there. I don't think there's a single Drupal site out there with less than 50 uh, modules. And so the point of Starshot and uh, the way I summarize it is to unlock the capabilities that were built for a really sophisticated developer audience for a site builder audience for the like lonely only sort of Drupal heroes. Um, and a lot of that capability exists now. You could do it today but we're gonna try and make it easier. Um, and there are people in this room who've figured out how to solve that problem and who can talk to those of you in this room who haven't yet and kind of share what they've done. So during the breakout sessions, I think that's gonna be a, a, a useful topic. Yeah, so oh, go ahead. I, I just wanted to, to share that one of the best backhanded compliments I ever received, or I guess the Drupal received in, in my presence was I was talking to a colleague of mine who worked for the St. Louis PBS station, and he had just finished waxing poetic about how he had finally managed to get his WordPress site to use structured data. And I was like, oh, that's adorable. <laughs> and um, <laughs> and then, then he asked me what platform I was on, and I said, oh, I'm on Drupal. And he said, oh, well, I guess that's good for security. Yeah. <laughs> so, you know. So I, I'm just going to say, as somebody who's worked yeah. as a developer for 
20 years, I don't remember when WordPress came out, in both, I built, I was a front end developer, I guess I still am, but I don't know. Um, that's a separate conversation. I, you know, I really, I've, I've built in both, I've built in Sitecore, I've built in custom CMSs, I've built in Joomla, but was it Mambo? I don't know, it forked. I, you know, I've, I've done a lot of building in CMSs and I choose, we choose, like Dev Collaborative chooses to work with in both because they are both, they're the best of breed. But a lot of clients come to us and they say, you know, we've heard that Drupal's really expensive and onerous and clunky to use and, you know, so we want WordPress. And they want, basically they want a Drupal site and they want us to build it in WordPress. And what happens when you do that is it can become really brittle to maintain over the long term. It can become a little bit more disposable as a, as a result. So like in three years when you kind of want to, you've evolved and you want to change your information architecture, your design, you might have to chuck that whole entire WordPress site and start from scratch, which is fine for some orgs, but if an org's like, I want to reuse this for ye like 10 years, then yeah. Drupal can handle that. And I think we need both. And um, I do think that they are um, the two best choices. And um, I want to talk about, I want you to talk a little bit about um, data sovereignty maybe. Yeah, so here's something that I think, so let's, let's zoom back out from some of the technical uh, side of this conversation and um, talk again a little bit about the, uh, the ethos and the alignment of nonprofit mission with open source because I think this is really important. Um, I am not going to ask for a show of hands on this question because it has become, I guess you can if you want, let's call it an optional show of hands. <laughs> but uh, how many of you work for organizations or know someone who works for a nonprofit organization that has been massively impacted by the Dobbs decision? This was the overturning of Roe v. Wade. Yeah. So another significant problem that we've seen in the nonprofit space and that we see in a variety of um, in a variety of contexts is what happens when the legal, regulatory, or even the temper tantrum of a billion dollar net worth CEO changes. <laughs> And, um, and suddenly your highly sensitive constituent information uh, is being exposed or, uh, or the way it's collected is being changed. So for example, um, uh, there are likely folks in this room who may be using um, apps to manage their periods, for example, and you may have seen these apps have been updating saying, oh, we now need your location information to track, uh, for some reason, to use this application, right? And the possibility of this being used or purchased from a data broker in states that now make um, abortion illegal and things like that is terrifying uh, for whole sets of constituencies. And this is something that if you have built the services that you provide on a proprietary platform, you may not be able to avoid. Uh, you may be stuck, you may be locked into this, and your constituents, despite your uh, mission, your point of view, the dedication that you've put into it, um, may not be able to trust you, not because of who you are, but because of the platform you're on. And it's one of the most important reasons to choose a platform, uh, preferably an open platform, I don't really care which one, but one that gives you data sovereignty. I'd love for it to be Drupal, but the point is, <laughs> I don't want it to be Facebook. Please not Twitter. He's you know, going back and exposing uh, public posts by people you've blocked to you, right? Um, there's a, there's a, an army of stalkers who are overjoyed right now, right? Like there's a lot of things here where a decision that seems good at the time, we need to meet our constituents where they are. This is where the fundraising is going to happen. And then like 10 years later, you're like, oh shit. How do we actually protect our community from this kind of change? Um, on the Drupal side, if you let me ramble a little bit, we uh, released something that we called an open web manifesto that I think will resonate with you as just nonprofit organizations. And I won't re read the whole thing, but the kind of core elements of our open web manifesto, this will remind you of the four freedoms if you're an open source nerd, are uh, the open web is more than a technology, it's a cause in and of itself. 
It's built on freedom. You should not need permission to learn, build, advance open web technology. Uh, you should not have to pay a licensing fee to be able to own your own data. <laughs> it's defined by decentralization. No single person or entity controls the open web. No billionaire CEO can redefine free speech. Um, it thrives on inclusion. Everyone in the world, regardless of background, identity, ability, wealth, or status, has a home on the open web as a user, creator, architect, and innovator. So importantly, it means inclusion is not just consumptive. It is not passive participation. Uh, everybody should have that place to be actively uh, involved. And it exists for empowerment. The open web should be fueled by our collective quest for innovation, connection, and progress, strengthened by individual right to choice, privacy, and security. So to do that, we need to be using platforms designed to protect, not exploit, personal data. We don't want a platform where, hey, we've entered all this information, and um, oh, they have this little clause that says we can update our terms of service at any time, and then we can, you know, you find out only through a press release that they've sold it all to Cambridge Analytica, or that they've sold it all to an AI training company, um, all of your internal data, right? It needs to be a platform that enables the next generation of innov innovators and entrepreneurs, right? We don't want to live in a web where the dominant publishing platform bans a whole category of nonprofits that they deem inappropriate for what they're doing or that they decide is politically inconvenient for who they support. Um, and it should be resilient to a changing world and not controlled by a few. So this is my, like, I, I'm, I'm preaching to the choir because you're all here at a DrupalCon. <laughs> but this is what I would implore the audience of people who are ethically minded first, which is always this nonprofit audience, to think about in the way they participate in, um, in digital community, right? Treating, treating your web presence not just as your flyer, um, not just as another version of a billboard, uh, but as the way you're choosing to engage in, um, in digital community and global community in the public square. So, anyway. Yes. Tim, I have a question, Tim. <laughs> um, so, Tim, like, it sounds cool, that really sounds cool, but, <laughs> like, there's a lot of word salad and esoteric terminology and you have to use composer and it's expensive and what the heck happened? It's so hard to upgrade from seven to 10. It's expensive, it's hard. Why? Why, <laughs> if, if, we want, if we want people to use Drupal and we want um, to have a better community that feels inclusive and welcoming to people who don't necessarily want to ever touch composer or the command line, then why? <laughs> Why, Tim? <laughs> yeah, gosh. Um, I should have I should have rambled longer till I ran out the clock. Um, you know, part of it is there are <laughs> the boring answers. There's some good underlying technical reasons and security reasons and other things why we're actually saving a huge amount of duplication of work by being able to use components from other communities, other open source communities, kind of join together with them to build parts of what become your web presence. But legitimately, beginning in 2016 with the 8 release, that's made things harder. And um, it's had to, we've had to turn around and figure out how to unlock that and improve that. And I do want to say, for those in the room who are with me, still on seven with a large portion of your web presence, um, it's way better than the first time you did that evaluation. Like now, right now, it's already better to, to do this migration and upgrade process and there's a huge amount of people who can help. And those people who can help are not just the people who only take enterprise clients for you know $15 million deals. Uh, there's folks who can do it at much smaller scales and who do deliberately work at much smaller scales. Um, so there's, um, uh, I think there is both truth to the fact that it is difficult, it was harder, it did leave some people behind, uh, but also that there has been a commitment to trying to improve that and fix that, and then that's continuing. And again, we'll talk more about some of the Starshot conversation, but one of the goals of that initiative is that you will not have to touch the command line, let alone Composer, at all, uh, if you don't want to. Um, we're gonna be back to a situation, and that includes module and theme installation and all these other components, configuration, content, like all this sort of stuff. So um, we are, like I said, we're trying to 
unlock a lot of really important, really powerful stuff that from a code base perspective, uh, again, like I don't want to dunk on my friends in, on, the, on the WordPress side, but from a code base perspective, there is a cleanliness to what we're doing um, in Drupal. There is a modernness to the underlying architecture that means that you are, you're not using a fax machine, like, right? You know, we're, we're, we're on kind of the, the, the most current and cutting edge. We are more than competitive with than the, uh, you know, billion dollar Adobe Sitecore type solutions. And we're trying to make that accessible to the lonely only one person starting a uh, nonprofit entity in their garage with their little kid licking envelopes. Um, right, so. So I have a quick question for the room that we didn't do during our sort of hand raise icebreakers. Raise your hand if you consider yourself to be an ambitious site builder. That phrase means a few. Yes. Okay. Okay. Thank you. That. Oh, do you? Mm -hmm. I, I was just gonna say that um, one of the things that. I've seen, I'm seeing the Drupal Association and the Drupal community, the Drupal, the people who kind of are more leading the Drupal project, they're, I think they're starting to realize, um, I mean, I was on the plane during the Dries note and it was um, live texted to me by Jess, thank you Jess. Um, but, um, Partner in crime. So I think it's, I think it's called Starlink, but I'm not sure. <laughs> in, 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 in any case, um, uh, it sounds, We've heard from the Drupal community many times, like, oh, we're gonna make site building better, you're not gonna need the command line, but it does, it sounds like it's getting more real. And I think um, one of the things that we've offered before is Jess and I convene spaces where nonprofit Drupalists gather, and we've been like, you know, you can like do some user testing and <laughs> With these user, people. user focus, interviews. Focus group. Yeah, and so we got one for today. Um, some folks are gonna come in during breakouts from Starshot, <laughs> and um, and maybe so ambitious site builder, ambitious site builders. Um, your feedback is really important because that is how this is gonna get better. Like any software product, it needs user input, and in open source, that sometimes lags or is a missing step. Um, because we're just trying to scratch our itch and solve something and we make a module and we saw and we release it and we don't really use or test it or it's just for our audiences. So that's something that we really appreciate is can ha yeah. it's gonna start today. And we'll just keep pushing to, you know, be annoying and tell the Drupal Association and other folks making Drupal like what we need. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. And I would add to that. So in particular, the two folks who were joining, um, Gabor Hochi and uh, Lori Escala, who are literally like the product leadership for the Starshot initiative. They are core maintainers. They are the ones who are trying to get that across the finish line before the end of this year. And so they'll be, both be in this room to join the boff table of the group of folks who want to talk about this and to talk to this audience specifically, because it's an audience that really makes sense to them. Um, and, but I, I would also add, the other kind of incredible thing about open source is for those of you who do have the interest, I know people working on nonprofit have so much free time, <laughs> but who do, for those of you who do have the interest, you can be directly involved as well. Like you can influence the product mode roadmap by being part of the product roadmap. So um, I certainly invite all of you to do that as well. And hopefully some of you checked out the contribution stuff yesterday. Yeah, do we wanna, um some questions and yeah. sure yeah we can take some questions we'll try and repeat them back because I think yeah we're... yeah um yeah does anyone have questions about any of this or any any comments you want to make because you know like we're here for you <laughs> <laughs> yeah This is a really good question. So the, the question was, does the Drupal Association have resource guides, one pagers, whatever, to, that can be used to internally sell Drupal to a C-suite audience or to kind of make the case of Drupal versus WordPress or Adobe, whatever scale you are, versus some of these other options. There are some of those resources, particularly underneath the Promote Drupal banner, the drupal.org slash marketing link. 
uh, is now aggregating those. That's actually one of the other initiatives that was announced here alongside Starshot was that specific effort. And people yesterday and today have been collaborating as a community to help create some of those. So some of that exists, but I think we need a lot more. Um, and frankly, I would, I would literally, I mean this with no like, no um, sarcasm or anything whatsoever. If you, if anybody wants to like email me, my, my email's right on the website and be like, this is what I need in order to do this, to sell this internally, to convince my boss, whatever, like I will find the people to make that happen. So um, you can reach out to me afterwards and I can put you in touch with the people in the room next door who are writing this stuff, so. Other questions? Yes. Maybe both. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So the, I think the question here is are there is there educational or onboarding materials for not community contribution, not the developer audience, not any of this, but for the actual like site editors who go in the back end and build the site using Drupal. Um, there is some, but I will freely admit that it's not as great as it could be. Um, and I think there are some great organizations. Um, one of the unfortunate things about having too much content at DrupalCon is that they, uh, they these things overlap. So there's some of these, the training companies that are really focused and are, are doing things today actually produce some amazing material and we've talked about aggregating some of that material for free on drupal.org so there is like the the site builders course that some of these folks do and they it, some of it's already published for free um, but we should centralize it on d.o so you don't have to go hunting for it um, I think that would be great um, I can I can add that the the cards on the table from n10 the nonprofit technology network that we all like is like Venn diagram like we're the overlapping circles here that we, we do a call um, every third Thursday of every month um, and the, all the information is at that link on that card. And it's, you know, a lot of times people will come on and be like, I'm new to Drupal, I, can you give me resources? And we can kind of hear a little bit more about like exactly what your role is. And there's tons of people on, who come to those calls who, and we ourselves, who like just ha can probably point you in the right direction and that is peer support, and you are absolutely welcome. You do not have to be a developer to be on that call um, at all. And also, I would say that, um, that uh, people come on and when they need to make um, arguments internally to their C-suite, WordPress versus Drupal. I mean, I can, I can do that in my sleep, <laughs> um, but it, it is, like, it's a really hard it's a really, it's, it's hard and sometimes it, it's best to tailor it to the, the you know, the C-suite you're talking to. Um, so you can come on that call and get people to kind of give you talking points too. So that's just an ongoing resource that's totally out there. It has an email list that used to be a listserv that worked awesome and now it's Salesforce and it works terrible. Um, but, um, and we're also on Drupal Slack. Um, there's a nonprofits channel mm -hmm. and we have a lot of conversations or like when we have back channel conversations about this stuff that can happen there too. So you can always pop on there and be like, hey, when's the next call? Can, we, can, I, can I come on and ask a question? We'll even be prepared for you. So just wanted to, yeah. I had a, along the same lines of um, that question. Do you as yourself as Dev Collaborative get on the call with um, um, like the C-suite if they're like, we're considering you as an agent to even, and we're also talking to this other CMS agent, um, yeah, agency. So do you already do this in your job? Yeah, I mean, remember when I said I was a, a lead grant writer and a webmaster? So um, that ported well to retiring from being a front-end developer and doing sales. So I do sales for Dev Collaborative, but I don't, I'm not salesy and I'm bad at capitalism. So as a result, um, <laughs> I basically just want to help people. And if we're a match, we're a match. And if we're not, we're not. And so I have those conversations when we're talking to potential clients all the time. We do sometimes, many, many agencies, including many of the, the agencies that I know in this room are all like really, really excellent. And they, we all 
many of us will do a CMS agnostic discovery process with you to figure out. I mean, we really only build in those two. I don't actually think that someone should be building in something else. So it's really between the two, and we kind of go down all the rabbit holes like with you um, in a kind of more involved way. But there's like a light conversational pre-process. But until, until people get to know you, it's really hard if, some, some organizations are like, I'm open to either, just tell me. Some of them are like, I love WordPress so much, but I want a searchable, like interrelated database of like content with entity relationships. And we're like, um, okay, you, yeah. Which you can build in WordPress. But um, uh, my developer in the room is a WordPress and Drupal developer. And um, yeah, she can tell you that that's not always wise. Um, so yeah, it's, it's, it's a simple conversation, but it's also a really complex conversation. Um, yeah, okay. yeah. More questions, oh. Well, I just wanna affirm how like, that conversation has to be tailored to the person you're talking to. Uh, as a different nonprofit, there's groups that'll tell that what size words are. Do you want a mic? No. <laughs> <laughs> Cool, I think that's a good response. Additional questions? Yes. Yes. Yeah, and uh, this is something I want to comment on briefly from a another perspective too, because some of these proprietary, so there's there's obviously proprietary systems where that's very much a sort of known issue. There are also systems that are, that seem open based on the way they do open APIs. Like there's things like the Contentful kind of model where they do sort of a backend data sort of database uh, that you're building a front end on top of if you're into slick JavaScript stuff or whatever. But that's like, again, you're in their sort of proprietary system. For now, they have an API for you to export out. Who knows when that changes or the terms of service change or any number of things. Like, I think they know that would sink their company if they ever did it, but um, if they get big enough, that might not be true. And, um, and again, who knows who is actually able to access that data, even if they promise you, oh, we're only looking in aggregate. Um, we're only selling aggregate statistics. Oh, the training model will be thrown away after they process it. Like, 
yeah, there's just sure. no way to know. Sure, sure, sure. Right. Yeah. Yep. <laughs> and you may have a legal one <laughs> in <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. And you know, you, you can ask yourself is it their data or your data? Um, do you, how explicit are you in that relationship with your constituents? Um, and yeah, let's not undersell the regulatory part, uh, especially if you operate internationally and uh, anywhere in Europe in particular, anywhere in California, um, increasingly across the rest of the US, although we'll be slow because hashtag capitalism, but yeah. Okay, question here. You're making a, a really important point, and I think um, I often garden path here. We're you know we're at a Drupal conference, right? I'm 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 gonna my first instinct is gonna be to talk about the technology and those sorts of things, but you're making a really excellent point that the beginning of this conversation should actually be, what's our mission again, and how does that translate to digital? Um, and that conversation doesn't almost doesn't even need to name a product. At the C-suite level, I almost like depending on the team, I almost suggest that the products not actually be part of the conversation so much as the requirements and the, the fit with mission. Yeah. And then hopefully the IT leadership is like, the best way to do this is X, right? Or your consultant group is the best way to do this is X. And sure, you report that, that back up. You're not like secretive about it. But the whole point is mm -hmm. you're not trying to tell them, hey, I want you to be a subject matter ex expert on these like open source things, isn't that made by weird people in basements who don't go outside? No, you're, I mean, yeah. you're, <laughs> okay. <laughs> Touch grass. Um, but no, it, but yeah, that actually really, the, the, the very first part of that leadership conversation should be how do we translate mission to a digital experience uh, and digital engagement and to constituent responsibilities. Uh, before you ever touch the technology. And, you know, I think that the natural evolution, the list of technical requirements that meets the, that value statement or that mission is probably going to lead you in a very specific direction. Yeah. Um, the, I joined N10 in 2002 um, and when it was just starting. And the thing that drew me to it in part was the message, never lead with the tool. And... You know, like at Dev Collaborative, like we we look at best of breed um, software solutions, and for most clients, we don't do CRM work. But when clients ask us our opinion, like most of our clients do better in like Salesforce, and so we're not averse to proprietary solutions when they are a best fit necessarily. Um, even though I I'm not a fan of Salesforce, uh, just to be clear. Um, but you know, I think that I stay in the CMS space because we have these two excellent systems um, that do align with a lot of the values that our orgs are coming to us with. Um, and so, but yeah, a lot of times when we do an agnostic discovery, it's really like focused on, yeah, what are your goals? What are your web communications goals? What are your content needs? What, do, what are your mission goals around your web communications? and then sort of con continue forth from there. Yeah. Yeah. And I would say from the, um, the in-house perspective, I would say it's also important to 
know your C-suite and know their tolerance for talking about things yes. like this. <laughs> so my organization, our CEO and president is a Rockefeller. I'm not going to try to explain Drupal or open source to her. Um, so by the time the conversation gets to that level, it's very high level. This is our plan. This is what we hope to achieve, but I'm not going to mention the word Drupal because it doesn't mean anything. So I, I think that that is also mm -hmm. important to be able to think, again, beyond the tool to sort of the reasons and the goals um, in, in a very sort of more philosophical and results-driven way versus I like this tool because it has really awesome structured data. Yeah. And <laughs> And not to undermine literally everything we just said. I promise I won't just do that. But um, <laughs> the one thing about it that is interesting, again, you know, my little screed about the Open Web Manifesto, right? That is, that is the intersection that I think is at the right level. This concept of, um, okay, if you're talking about your specific digital mission on the web, you need to understand what your overall vision of the web should be that you want to be a constituent of. Mm -hmm. And that is a conversation that you can have at a leadership level, right? Do we believe that the web should be corporate owned? Um, are we going to participate in that becoming the future? Um, or are we going to deliberately and in the course of our mission and without compromising our mission, in fact, by serving our mission better, uh, participate in building a uh, public web, uh, a web that remains open. So. And Don't collect it. Yeah. And why do you store it? Because if it's not necessary, then you're wasting your time and everyone else's time. I think I saw a hand in the back. Oh. Oh, and there's one over here too, but. Okay. <laughs> I'll go, let's. I think let's go here. Yeah. Let's go here, and then we'll go back here. Oh, yeah. <laughs> oh, boy. <laughs> no, yeah, yeah. No, it's okay. Yeah, so this is, okay, so we're talking about the rise of the machines. I hope everyone <laughs> has been stalking in your secret bunkers and preparing. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, no, we're talking about AI, and this is a, uh, this could have been a different can of worms. This is like the, the, the vending machine that's become self-aware of worms. Um, but um, the specific question was about content protection, um, and there's, a, there's multiple facets. One is, our public content on the web how do we protect that from being becoming part of training data that somehow then gets regurgitated by a, well, let's not say competitor because we're talking about a nonprofit space, but content that is then used in a model that might be done by your ideological opposite fighting against mm -hmm. you um, is a real thing. And um, we've, I've actually already seen some examples where like, a twisted version of a mission statement of an organization on one side of the political spectrum showed up in an attack ad on another one. And it's like, it subverts like the whole copyright thing because basically we've decided to ignore copyright law until something goes to the courts because there's too much venture capital involved. Um, and it's, it's, it's a challenging situation. The problem is um, to have any true technical guarantee of avoiding content scraping 
we would have to violate all of the incredible work we've done to make content accessible. So um, unfortunately, we can't serve our audience of folks who need like structured output for screen readers, um, who need all of these kinds of things without making that machine accessible. And frankly, even if we like, even if we converted it all to PDFs, right, we, all of us who have been asked, are you a robot over and over, right, have been betrayed by that, all of that data being used to train the robot so that it can solve the same problem. Yeah. Um, so I, I wish I had an answer to your question. The answer is going to have to be regulatory. It's going to have to be punitive penalties for folks who engage in this in some form, and I'm not convinced that's going to happen. So that begins to ask the question, how do we think about, uh, this was mentioned on the main stage as well, uh, I was introducing the AI keynote on, on Tuesday, and um, we don't have a choice about living in an AI future. Um, that is not a choice we get to make. So instead, uh, the choice we have is do we let it happen to us, or do we find a way to participate in it to try and make it better and more responsible? And that, might, that participation might be using regulatory influence if we uh, have those kinds of connections. That participation might be technical if you can get involved in that sort of way. Um, that participation might be shouting from the rooftops in every um, echo chamber of social media that you can find. Um, of course, you'll just be shouted back by 10 times as many bots. But, you know, it's a, a, it's a scary kind of time. Um, I will also say there are some, there is opportunity for ethical uses of AI technology to advance our missions. Um, we have a lot to be cautious of, but we also have some things that are potentially quite useful for us. Um, and so what we're, what we're really trying to avoid is actually what happened during the crypto hype cycle. <laughs> so uh, the block, blockchain technology, again, not to nerd out too much, actually there is a value proposition that none of us get to hear anymore about decentralized trust and about the idea that you actually don't need a central authority to tell you if uh, the, this information you're receiving is legitimate, if these health records are, at, like there's these, all these things you can do with blockchain technology that actually go back to our data sovereignty question and let you have a way to say, oh, we don't need to give a central data broker this to know that we can trust its accuracy. Like that's the real value proposition um, that could have affected so many industries that was completely overwhelmed by the currency hype train. And as a result, it's almost impossible to try and talk about the possible so, uh, social value of that side of the crypto conversation because the baby's been thrown out with the bathwater, right? It was so overwhelmed by the um, kind of VC gold rush that uh, you know the people who are doing the good thing with it probably have to call it something else. <laughs> they probably have to pretend it has nothing to Rebrand. do with crypto now. <laughs> and we might wind up in a similar place with uh, AI and this kind of stuff. Um, I, you know, Microsoft is going the route of calling them co-pilots. Uh, literally everything's a co-pilot now. I don't know. It just makes me think of airplane and that's not a good association. <laughs> but, um, <laughs> but anyway, the, um, so, you know, I think it's a way bigger conversation. Maybe I should have put it on the parking lot, but um, it's multifaceted. I think we are going to have to use our sort of voices and our own influence um, and try as best we can not to be passive participants or victims of the, this hype cycle. Yeah, yeah. I would also um, note that, excuse me, um, I think it was last month, N10 uh, released yes. a, uh, artificial intelligence framework for an equitable world, which doesn't have any answers, but does have a lot of really good questions that nonprofits specifically should be asking as they are contemplating using AI to assist in their mission um, from the technology perspective all the way through to like HR. Don't do it for HR. Um, Just don't do it. Or, or grant writing or anything like that. If you're thinking about using AI to sort of give you some shortcuts or whatever, these are the questions you should be asking yourself before you trust you're giving your data to the AI or, and before you trust what the AI spits back at you. Yep. Yep. So. Can you say that again? Sure, it is the Artificial Intelligence Framework for an Equitable World, and it is on the N10 website at nten.org. And um, 
for someone who's hiring, don't use AI to write your cover letters. Um, we know. Um, <laughs> uh, that's weird. Um, there was another question or comment in the, in yes. the back. Well, you're up, okay. your hand is up now, so go and for I it. I think John also had a question. Oh, did oh, yeah. John have a, okay. We'll go. Hold on. John? Wait, where is John? He's right in the middle oh. in the brown jacket. Yeah. <laughs> Wait, what's your question? Yeah. There, it's true. There are. Yep. So, like, this is serious, okay? And so uh, we have a we have a, a strategy at Edinburgh to, to do with this, and a, a key part of that is Drupal. Now, yeah. I'm not going to try and pretend that Drupal answers absolutely the questions, but a big part of the jigsaw puzzle for us is Drupal, and uh, our specific <coughs> product manager for us to manage here, and he made a very good point that a lot of how we reach our obligations for accessibility is governance, and that can go from the fact that like when we get developers in that you're using the framework system rails in to make sure that the, 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 the work they do is accessible from reconfiguring the editing environment like what guardrails we put in place like what comes in so I'm not trying to pretend that Drupal is um, accessible at a box although I will say if you do it from scratch then you could make an argument you're close yeah. guardrails, but uh, you still have to do the work beyond that but if, uh, if I had to go and recommend a content management system for yeah. accessibility I would personally I would definitely have to recommend Drupal you know you know it's so funny because, you know, we were talking earlier about tailoring your conversation to the particular audience or to the particular mission. And like, if we were just saying you have to pick the most accessible or the platform with the most potential to be the most uh, accessible, like it's hard to put anything else even in the conversation, yeah. right? Um, even a multilingual as well, um, I think. And one of the things, if you're in that kind of environment, partly because both the United Nations and the European Parliament are all using Drupal for everything that they do, and as well a lot of the federal and state governments in the United States. Like, it's a major part of Drupal's roadmap to keep doing that really, really well, and there's a lot of people who work on those problems. So again, you can leverage the fact that others are solving problems that you too want to solve, and you can do, as you said, if you configure some of these things properly, a lot of the workflows, a lot of the workspace management, you can enforce this in the way your content editors work, instead of having like Google document checklists of post publishing review processes, right? right? You can you can make sure it's right before it gets to the web. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, I just like so Dev Collaborative's one of our primary focuses um, is accessibility because um, I actually started my formal training in public broadcasting. So we have Justin and I have that at WGBH in Boston in 2000. And that was like central to my training. And I've carried those values forward because I really care about accessibility in all the ways, not just like for screen readers, but there's so many ways to make a website more accessible. The reason I would say that most of our projects are in Drupal is because that you can do it in WordPress, but Drupal is absolutely superior in its ability to, to support content editors to maintain accessibility after launch which is, you, you can't, you can launch it, it's like 100, you know, in Google Lighthouse or whatever, which has problems, but that's a separate conversation. And everyone's like, woo, it's accessible. And then people are putting like, um, you know, uh, I don't know, like papyrus font and um, like low contrast colors in there. And then they, you know, they're making- Embedded their own, PDFs. And, and they're putting, they're locking everything in PDFs, which is a, I'm sure nobody has this problem here. Mm, no. um, um, and yeah, why PD, they still exist. Anyway, um, so yeah, and I do think that that is another values conversation you can have in your organization. Most organizations that we work with, including higher ed, basically have a, an unfunded mandate. So they're, they're like, you know, make it accessible. We're not gonna test it. <laughs> We're not gonna pay for people who 
our like screen reader users to check it. So what we try and do is just do it as best we can, like right out of the gate and question every single thing we build. Like, is, th is this accessible? Is this okay? And we do that in both CMSs and it is much easier in Drupal. So, and so that comes back to the whole conversation about <laughs> how can we get the cost down and just the, the, the enterprise stack requirements a little lower so that organizations who can't afford, you know, enterprise, like full on enterprise prices for web development can actually have something also multilingual, absolutely complete, which is a form of accessibility, totally superior in Drupal. It truly is. Um, so those things are really important. And how can we, you know, lower the, the cost of, of entry here? for orgs because orgs need that complexity a lot of the time even when they can't totally afford it. Cool. So we did we yep. did have that question in the back which I think is the last one we have time for. Is it too huge, too late? Well, I mean, <laughs> that's a, it's a really good question, right? And for some organizations, uh, presumably mostly ones who are not here in this room, but for some organizations, that's already true, right? There's already folks who have had to make a replatforming decision. They've already made another selection. They've already sort of moved away. Um, and that's, that's going to be the reality. But the other thing is, um, you know, I have also been in Drupal since the 4.7 era. Um, and I, th I have a reasonable expectation that Drupal's gonna be here for 10, 15, 20, 40 more years, who knows? We, we're, you know, along with Linux, we're one of the oldest projects and we, you actually, you can't look at a 100 year history of what a software project looks like because there aren't any that are that old, right? And so we're beginning to learn what that looks like. So while it's true, it's true from the perspective of if you consider the future of Drupal to be based on the people who have like perhaps in nonprofit, I mean, based on the people who've clung on so far, um, perhaps some of this is coming too late. On the other hand, even those people who've attritioned away and all of the new nonprofits that emerge every year, post Starshot, it'll, it'll be a great time to give it another look. The next time they're doing a replatforming, redesign on yeah. something else, they may come back. And for all of us who are still there, we'll be able to you know, begin to reap those benefits and also influence and improve it further based on our kind of particular experience. So I think you're completely right, but also I think I have a slightly different perspective that has some hope on regaining some of that momentum. Yeah, yeah. I think we can make this better. Um, and those of us who are able to stick with it to help make it better, that's, you know, let, we're doing that. And if you, yeah. And I know we have to wrap here. We're going to do a, a break and a demo. I'm going to go next door to like lasso the Starshot folks and make sure they're here in time for the conversation. Thank you for so I'll that, be I'll be back that's in mixing metaphors. I think you're going to okay. laser them in or something. Uh, yeah. Well, a tractor, a tractor, tractor, tractor beam. beam. Tractor what am I beam. Saying? Yeah. Gosh, sorry. It's early. Okay. Yes. So. Before you run away, yes. thank you Thanks, so much. Thanks. I will be right back. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Now the fire's gone. I'm like, oh, no, no, no. Hot mic. We don't want to be like the jinx.
Hey everybody, if we could take our seats, that would be great. I think so. They're the presenters, so but yeah. That's easy. So we'd like to introduce um, yeah, Amanda and Emily from Sandstorm, who are, are our wonderful sponsors for today's activities. Do this. <laughs> Feel the energy. Let's do this. <laughs> are you, is it on? I think it's on. Yes. Everybody hear us? Yeah. Fantastic. Like we said, I'm Amanda. This is Emily. We're with Sandstorm. We're pumped to be here. Mm -hmm. um, and we want to just sort of take you a little bit on a journey, right? We uh, work with a think tank, nonprofit um, organization, and they've gone through much of a, a, a large transformation. Um, and what we've obviously been doing a lot the last couple days is just learning all the things in Drupal, applications, solutioning, right? And so what we want to Hope focus on is some of that, but also some of the decision-making process that went into uh, getting them into their current site. So a little bit of a journey, we'll, we'll kind of walk you through that. A uh, little bit about Sandstorm. You see straws? Yes, everybody's got straws on their tables. Um, but we are a, an accessibility certified UX design agency. Everything we do is rooted in research and UX testing. We've done over 4,600 hours of in-depth user research, UX testing, one-on-one -on -one qualitative interviews. So at the heart of it all, we want to understand what users need and help leverage that information to drive the decisions we make, the, de the design, um, and obviously the, the implementation. And a little bit about Milken Institute, right? So they are a nonprofit, nonpartisan um, organization. They're a think tank. And so really their sort of mission is to uh, sort of address all a lot of the global problems and challenges in the world and bringing people together to help move the needle forward with those, with those specific initiatives. So happenstance, they actually had their global conference this week while we were at DrupalCon, <laughs> but um, I don't know that you could probably predict who was at this conference, but uh, let's say Bill Clinton, um, uh, Will I Am, <laughs> uh, David Beckham, right? So again, bringing sort of these very prominent figures together to focus on these global issues and really look to moving that needle forward. And for Milk, the Milken Institute, we did everything from design, working through um, research, obviously the Drupal development, um, and so we're going to talk about sort of all of these aspects of it, but also share a little bit again of the insight into the why. Why did we make those decisions together? What was some of that rationale? So, just a. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Sorry. <laughs> Go ahead. Okay. Um, so just to go through a little before, so this is actually the current site too. The, the new site will launch soon. So you're getting a little bit of a sneak peek, but this is the, the before. So take it in, see if you can tell what they do. <laughs> a lot going on. A lot of content, What's a lot. That? What do they do, Emily? What do they do? <laughs> So that was one of the biggest opportunities. Can, the, can their homepage quickly explain who they are and what they do? Um, what can we do to improve visitor engagement? Today, most of their visits are two pages or less. They had no real conversation, um, sorry, conversion opportunities, no way to say, yeah, I'd like to learn more about what you're doing. I'd like to stay involved. And they also just had some major site performance and reliability issues. Uh, for months, they were having little loading spinners on most pages when you went to them. So as we delved into the project, uh, the four, four of the biggest challenges were timeline. They have this big, giant global conference that takes all of the staff time and focus. So we're really trying to schedule everything around that, trying to hit before. We, we're going to hit after. Um, <laughs> We had limited access to the users, particularly their funder market, um, which they wanted to improve their messaging for. Um, we needed to equip the in-house team for ownership. They had two developers that are full-time. They needed to understand everything that we were doing. They needed to be on board with our decisions, so they'd be in a good position to handle all of those day-to-day -day, uh, needs that came up. And then we had this giant event, this mission-critical event functionality that we needed to not break. Right. So next year when they have Will I am, and they're live streaming him, it needs to not be a problem that we have a new website. 
Uh, so, as many projects do, we started with discovery and personas, but in a hurry. So we did stakeholder workshops, working with all of the um, their centers for philanthropy, for health, for finance. We did little follow-up meetings to go deeper into some of the areas. We did one-on-one -on -one interviews. We didn't get a big number, but we got a lot of really valuable insight that was tip different than other similar organizations, uh, different than other general user groups that are, uh, that you'll see, drove some of our decisions. Uh, one of the uh, more scrappy uh, ways that we, we did um, some of the user research was a social media profile review. So they gave us you know, some typical people in, in their target audience. Here are people that are really um, important in terms of reaching for the organization. And we looked at uh, what were their career paths? What, are, what kind of content are they sharing? What are their frames of reference? Um, in terms of like, you know, what, what are the web experiences that uh, we're gonna wanna look at to, to make sure that we're relying on some of those co uh, conventions and patterns to build our experience. We looked at the assets that were actually successful at saying who they are and what they do. Did a content inventory, of course, and reviewed analytics, and then we did a competitive analysis with a little, a little AI cheat to get us started on that. Um, this is one of my favorite things to do is like what organizations are similar to the Milken Institute? The answers are typically different than who they think, but usually bring in a lot of really good examples. And I have it create a little table so we can say, let me know what's the tone of the content, what's, what are the differentiators, and it's a good, a good uh, kickstart to get started on that. So as we moved into development planning, the big decision was, are we going to develop in place or are we going to migrate to a new site? So is it the save as or the clean slate? It was a Drupal 10 site, and you're like, I hate to waste a perfectly good Drupal 10 site if we can make it work, right? Like, why rebuild everything if we don't have to? Um, and so we looked at, you know, the benefits being we could do less migration, we could not rebuild that entire Salesforce events integration. Uh, the drawbacks are, that we have to live with some of the choices that those who came before us have made. Those who came before us were, you know, big fans of having media be viewable pages. Um, they used ECK entities. Has anybody used ECK entities? No. I'm sure there are good reasons. Um, <laughs> they're not how we typically do it. Um, and then there was just these like general risks and fears that uh, you know, they, were, they had a lot of baggage about the site and were like, maybe it's just a bad egg and, you know, if you don't clean slate it, we're not going to solve the problems. But spoiler alert, <laughs> we did the save as. Uh, the title of the presentation might have given that away. Um, but we did a code audit, we reviewed everything, and things were in pretty good shape. Um, and we picked a cutover date where we were sort of forking, like, you know, we're going to be making some updates in the meantime on live, um, both in code and content that we're going to have to manage along the way. We developed a Drupal architecture plan in concert with their in-house team. So we went through, we aligned on principles, we talked through all of the decisions, and we weighed the, the pros and cons of any of the transformation and migration that we were gonna need to do. And then we just built a brand new theme. So we didn't have to worry about any conflicts there. We're like, clean slate that. And whereas the current old site mostly used paragraphs, we went all in on Layout Builder. So nice clean lines where we didn't have too much translation. So the uh, Drupal architecture planning, our guiding principles, number one was to be nice to content administrators, both present and future. <laughs> so um, let's not have to come into the site and completely relearn. Oh, it went away for a second. Um, uh, you know, figure out where all the content might be hidden. So the current site had it, you know, you could go under media for some things, you could go under ECK and ECK entities for some, <laughs> content types for some. Um, and so our, our, our general decision was viewable pages are content types. We were really stingy in introducing new content types. Uh, so every content type, of course, has its own level of effort. Um, but let's do do a new content type when there's a unique set of fields or when we want to set people up for success with a default layout and layout builder. And then 
We've taken every measure we can to not need to touch that events integration with Salesforce because it had been so carefully constructed and refined over the years. Topic change, taxonomy now. <laughs> um, but the number one thing that we heard in the user interviews was the desire to have content labeled by very specific topics. So talking to somebody that's a Hill staffer, they don't want to find topic on health. They want to find topic that's on you know, Medicare reimbursement or something even more specific than that. So we needed to get a taxonomy that was very comprehensive that we could reapply to thousands of nodes. They had 17 existing vocabularies to sort through. Some of them had been abandoned. Some of them were the messy tags list. Some of them were close to where we were headed. Um, and believe it or not, they had some subject matter experts that had really strong opinions on these, on these <laughs> topics. And uh, basically, the entire project success was tied to getting this right. So some of the things that went well, um, I like to reduce, reuse, recycle when it comes to taxonomy. So when we were looking at the topics one, which is like the biggest, most important um, vocabulary for this site, we got all of these similar vocabularies. We found the areas of expertise. We found uh, the messy tags list, the existing topics list or series list. We consolidated them. We removed duplicates. We got rid of the ones that were vague or weird. Um, we picked the one that was the closest and then we updated that one in place. So we edited the terms, we added in the nesting, we deleted terms so that content would at least have a starting point where somebody had tagged it and assigned something that would, would continue to have some value. Like I said, we nested because we needed to get to the level of specificity that the users wanted. We were gonna have about 80 terms, right? So we needed to add in some, some layers there to make that manageable. And then we used AI to refine it. Um, so this is an area where you get so deep and you're like, okay, I've, I've, I've gotten really tied to these five terms, but then I'm gonna bring in an outside perspective and ask it to refine it. And then you're like, oh, well that, that just makes sense. Like that, most of the examples, like most of the refinement that I did, I'm like, oh yeah, that's, that's how somebody coming in fresh would have thought of this. So that ended up being really helpful. Um, and then we took that, that taxonomy and went to the negotiating table and it went really smoothly, um, as you can see with the high fives. Uh, <laughs> but isn't a really important part of the process, right? Because we had to be, it had to be accurate. Nothing had to feel um, wrong for, for people that were in this space. So we, we went through that process and uh, obviously came out on the other side with a lot of improvements. And then with such a long, uh, taxonomy list. We needed a, so you'll see this is sort of a preview of the, the upcoming design. Um, we have a topics item in the nav and a way to show, get you to, how do you get to 80 topic pages without just forcing people to go through a lot of pages and without having an overwhelming mega menu. And this is our solution. Which is all very keyboard accessible. It's the same interface that you use on mobile, but we have a way to sort of navigate, to drill down without having to be very precise with your mouse and a way to drill back up. So, inspiration coming from the Target shopping experience. <laughs> <laughs> Search was the other really important thing, particularly to internal stakeholders who all thought their search was garbage. Um, but it really, it, it, looking into it and taking, like, you know, looking under the hood, there was a lot of advanced configuration that had happened. It was built on solar. Uh, a lot of, a lot of really good work had been there, but it was getting a bad rap because, you see that show advanced filters button? Everything the users wanted was actually hidden under there, and they were encountering just some performance issues where things weren't getting re-indexed on time. So yeah, once you open that, all of the filters that I've been hearing about that people are like, it would be great if you could filter by format, and it was right there all along. <laughs> I feel so bad for the ones who came before who had put so much work into it. <laughs> um, and part of the, the answer to rebuilding the search um, was using this 
relatively new module, highly recommend, called Search Web Components. And we actually worked with Kyle on the implementation for the Milken Institute. And it removes a lot of the, um, the objections that I usually get when doing a, design, a dev review of the design for the search page that we want to do, where you're like, oh, well, that's, that's part of the form. You can't split that up. Or, oh, are we doing AJAX? Are we going to hit the apply button or not? Um, this, this really takes care of all of those problems and gives you the flexibility to put the components where the design wants them to be. Um, and we ended up using that not only for site search, but also for the topic pages, for lists of experts, for their event program. All of those pages also had previously suffered a lot in terms of performance because they were pulling in a lot of data, but this has been speedy, speedy, speedy. So write that one down if you're thinking about it. <laughs> um, and in terms of the design, uh, we looked, um, we're showing only filters that limit the list. So if, uh, if clicking it would result in no answers or no change in answers, then we're not showing that it's a filter. We're updating the list instantly, as users have come to expect with most shopping experiences again. Uh, we're exposing the filter so you don't have to find them under advance. We're not hiding them. We're like making it very apparent, but we're pairing that with some show more functionality for those lists that are very long. So when we need to be able to see that there are multiple filters, we do that. We have an autocomplete for any of the longer lists, so like experts or events where there would be hundreds of options in a dropdown. We've um, added that. We're also showing the number of results and giving users control for how many they want to show on the page. Uh, giving paths to sibling pages, so if I'm on private equity, I've got a path to see all of the other topics that are related to financial markets and then really context-rich results. So we've got the format, the title, some teaser, the author, um, some tags and the date. So a lot of information so I can choose the right item. And now a little preview of the after. This is the home page, which uh, leverages Layout Builder um, for, for most of it, and, and actually throughout the site, a lot of uh, beautiful patterns. Um, available. So much better. Can you tell who they are and what they do? <laughs> <laughs> there are pillars here. Am I a health? Am I finance? That's something else that will be introduced with the new site. So some care and attention. That's beautiful. Yeah. Uh, just a quick uh, summary of lessons learned, what we would do, what we would not do again. We would not rely as heavily on, on manual tagging. People volunteered, we'll go retag it all, that's fine, we want to get it right, but thousands of pages takes a lot of time. Um, wouldn't hesitate to use the AI for taxonomy help and just working as a, as a sort of second set of eyes on that. Um, and we did a lot of um, very close collaboration with the in-house team. They've reviewed every PR, basically, so that they are completely familiar with all of the work. Um, but they could, it could also be a bottleneck sometimes, so we wouldn't, in the future, rely on them for in-house, for deployments so that we could keep working but have, still involve them with uh, all of the reviews. And then things we would do again, uh, the user research, like I said, um, you know, you talk to one user group, you've talked to one user group, we always learn new things when we're talking to somebody that's very specifically in their audience. Uh, erring on the side of transparency and collaboration with the dev team, we have a great relationship and I really feel like it's going to be in good hands as they begin to support it going forward. And that search web components, it's magic. So, I don't think we have time for questions. No, <laughs> not, but thank you so much. Uh, thank you. Oh, that's it? Yeah, 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 yeah we'll definitely be here. Day. Feel free to scan, you can yeah. get to our page, get to the deck. You know, anything you want to take a look at, we'll be here. Talk to them at lunch. Yes, yes, yes exactly. definitely. And we're really grateful to you for sponsoring. Yeah. And um, I love that your accessibility focus. This is like a great match. Thank you so much. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you all. Thanks Thank for you. being here. So as those of you who have attended our calls in the past might know, we sometimes just change things on the fly as necessary what? based on current what? events. And so we are making an executive decision to kind of switch up our program a little bit today. And instead of going into breakouts right now, we have 
Gabor and Lori here to talk about Starshot, and we thought we, rather than like try to fit everybody around like two tables, we would just do a kind of a town hall conversation so everybody can participate. Does that sound cool? All right. And then we'll do both breakouts after lunch. Yes, but we're still going to do all the breakouts. And just it's going to be boxed lunch um, over by the coffee shop. Um, for all summits, so you can just go get a box lunch and like chill out with whomever you feel like. Or go outside in the sunshine. Or go outside. Don't go outside because you won't come back in. <laughs> so stay inside. It's te it's raining. It's snowing out. Right. Yeah. And so, all right. <laughs> it's terrible out. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> yes, definitely. Totally. Can we I have, have too many beverages. I'm sorry. Yes. Can I help? Could you just, uh, you know, could you just take that water? Thank you, and just stick it over on that table. Oh, thank you. It's back. It started getting a little chilly again, so we decided we'd bring the fire back. <laughs> um, we're gonna get organized over here in just a second. So. Before we kick this off, we talked about it this morning quite a bit, but is there anyone who's completely unfamiliar with what the Starshot thing we're all talking about is? Uh, there's at least one hand. Anybody else? Okay, I'm sure there's more people in the room who actually are not familiar, but um, don't want to raise their hands. It's all right. We can't all be that brave. Um, so Starshot was an initiative announced in Dries's keynote on Monday, Dries the Drupal project founder. Uh, about the future of Drupal. And it is an intensive initiative that is uh, designed to be acted upon very quickly in the style of the, you know, sort of JFK era moonshot, except instead of, you know, uh, eight years in eight months. And the goal is to create a, this is where a lot of confusion has come in, to create a version of Drupal that packages together Drupal core with the best of the contrib ecosystem and some key functionality like automatic updates and a project browser and this notion of a recipe installer to be able to give you a really strong out of the box experience with Drupal sort of right from the get go. And you might have heard ideas around this in ages past called things like small core or whatever or maybe you are familiar with the old uh, concept of distributions um, and uh, how they can be difficult to extract yourself from after you've adopted them, right? So this brings a lot of new ideas uh, into a, uh, a landscape that fulfills what we were talking about earlier of empowering users at large to take advantage of a lot of capabilities that Drupal has offered but not unlocked for those ambitious site builders. So I'll ask the folks here to introduce themselves. I won't assume you know who they are. So Laurie, why don't you go first? Yep, um, Laurie Escola. I work in Aqueous Drupal Acceleration team, and I'm one of the Drupal core product managers. Hi, I'm, hi. Hi, <laughs> I'm Gabor Hoichi. I work with Drupal for 21 years this year, in August. Uh, also at the Acquia Drupal Acceleration team and also a core committer. Awesome, so this is going to be a Q&A style fireside chat, right? So we want your questions. We want your feedback and understanding of, of what you think your needs are from the nonprofit space. Concerns. We, uh, concerns, anything like that. Um, in particular, we did talk earlier about this sense of did Drupal leave some folks behind, some folks in this room and some folks who are no longer in this room at nonprofit events. So we'd be curious to hear about that. So any first questions from the audience? Yeah. Sure, would someone like to explain what recipes are? Um, so recipes is, are essentially a one-time installers in the sense that they allow you to automate things that the site builder would usually do manually. So you could have some instructions within a recipe, for example, to create an article content type. And once you've applied that recipe, the content type exists in your site, but the recipe is gone at that point. If the author of that recipe decides to change the recipe, it doesn't have any impact on the site because of the recipe was already applied to the site at an earlier stage. Yeah, so I, I like to say that it's automated <coughs> site building steps that you would do otherwise. 
Yeah, uh, another sort of more extended metaphor is recipes can be relatively simple, very straightforward. They can be more complex. A recipe could include um, installing and enabling three different modules that are related to event, event management. It could then create a content type using some fields provided by those modules. It could then create default content provided by all of those things, and then you sort of pre-configured your site as an event management platform or having event management features. They're also mix and matchable in ways that distributions weren't. So if you're like, oh, we need to add commerce for donation management, um, and we want to tie that in, you could then add a uh, donation management recipe that has its own set of modules, configuration, default content. Um, so those are defined in a, a technical format, but intended to be like browsable, one-click installable by the site builders when they're doing a Drupal installation. Good first question. Here we go. So we don't have specific plans around how are we going to tackle those problems, but we are aware of the problems and part of the sort of agenda is to look into what can we do to make that experience better. Um, so if any, anyone has ideas on, on what the improvements could, could be or even want to provide feedback on what those challenges are, all of that is, is, would be well appreciated. I would say that the place that the project is exploring that the most at the moment is in the, within the automatic updates initiative and the package manager component of the automatic updates initiative. Because, of course, automatic updates are most valuable to the kind of audience that's going to host on shared hosting. So they have been looking at, like, you know, what kind of access to the file system do you get in shared hosts in order to be able to do an automatic update. And that same package install process would be used for the, the kinds of packages that install recipes and all these other things. So if they manage to solve the problem there, it's likely that the problem can be solved in the general case. For, for Drupal shared hosting, abstracting away from needing the command line and abstracting away from needing a composer. But I think it's early in the star shot to know if, it's, if that's gonna make it onto the rocket. Yeah, we, we had this discussion that in the, in the good old days, uh, Drupal was offered in like a Bluehost cPanel thing that you could just launch Drupal and, and be done. And I think that what Starshot aims to do initially is more to bring the functionality to a point where it makes sense to offer that again. Because currently, this you, uh, if Bluehost would offer that, you would get this like very bland basic thing that's complicated. And Starshot wants to offer a thing that finally users can use out of the box. And so then we can get back to Bluehost and we're like, hey, we finally have a thing that when you put in there, it makes sense to your users. And then we can talk about this again. So that's the idea. Yeah. Uh, are uh, people have got to I manage a bunch of sites as an organization. We want to install a common feature set and we create our own recipes. Is that like a scripting language you're coming up with? YAML or Composer? How does it, how's it work inside? Uh, just to repeat the question, it was can people create their own recipes if they need to, if they want to deploy across multiple sites? If, is this something that's just part of Drupal and Drupal defined or something you can leverage yourself? Um, so recipes can be defined as YAML. Uh, so you can have recipes that are shared at, in Drupal.org for the community at large. We are shipping some recipes as part of the Star, Star, Starship project itself, but you can also create recipes for your organization yourself. Uh, at the moment, it's all done manually in that YAML format, but we're also exploring some ideas how we could make a UI that you can use to generate those recipes without actually having to write YAML by hand. Is this going to be a replacement for features? Uh, it, like, so there are similar use cases to, to features, but it's, I would not say that it's a one-to-one -one as in what features provides. Like, same idea, being able to move functionality from one site to another, but not necessarily to keep them up to date. I think what this, I think what the nonprofit sector really 
particularly needs is something that they can figure out um, a lot with, you know, on their own. It, it's a new space that you have to learn. It's not, you're not going to probably go into the object oriented PHP and hack at it and like you would have in days of yore. Um, so I think a UI is really important because I think that um, even if someone has help of an, of an agency um, in supporting a Drupal site, like the, the notion that you could create recipes in a UI is much more approachable than YAML. As a developer, I don't find YAML particularly friendly. Um, I mean, it's fine, but so um, I think, I don't know, um, I think it would, it would need learning the UI and learning what it means um, to use it, but I just want to throw that out there. And I think you're you are absolutely right. Uh, so we are starting with providing sort of the foundation. This is how we uh, express something uh, that is considered a recipe. And then the next step is how can we make it easy for someone who is not familiar with Drupal to create one without having to learn yeah. a lot. And that's, that's an ideology that we're trying to apply across everything that we're doing. So the experience builder, which is part of the Starshot initiative as well, uh, what we are aiming to do is try to take Drupal teaming and creating pages and configuring all of that to a form where it's easy for someone who has never used Drupal before to, to express their brand and content model uh, within Drupal. Uh, so you should be able to ultimately create your whole site, including your custom brand, completely within browser without never leaving that. Yeah. That's so great. Uh, I'm gonna go to the back first. So yeah, this is uh, repeating the question. Is it a tool for the initial build of the site only? Or, and I think the question is more about recipes than about Starshot as a whole, but is it for building the site from the start or is it for something that you can add an additional component later? So the example was if I need to add events to my site, can I install an event recipe after the fact, after I've deployed a site? Yeah, so uh, Starshot aims to s aims to provide you with a base understanding of what Drupal as a usable thing would make sense. So I think those of us that use Drupal and have the experience know the capabilities of Drupal, that you can do a lot of different things. So we want to put the base understanding of the CMS into Starshot. And then these optional recipes on top where you can install events, you can install donations, you can install a bunch of other recipes on top of that that you want and combine them on your site. So the Starshot brand itself is for the idea of the initial experience, but it also includes the functionality to add further recipes on top of that that may be initially provided by the Starshot team and then maybe then extended by the community with the recipes provided. But in particular, that does not mean only at initial. It's not like you can only do that on the initialization of the site. Yep. Uh, the goal is that you can do that on, on once the, that site has been up, it's been up for six months, you can still go back into a project browser and say, oh, here's another recipe that we need now. Um, so that's certainly part of the direction it's working towards. There was a question. Oh, yeah, let, let me clarify. So this, this question is sort of like, if you're using Starshot, does that mean you sort of locked yourself out of the composer way of doing things or the like the more developer centric? Are you somehow on a, uh, have you gone down a garden path you can't get back from? Um, and so that's one of the sort of founding principles for everything that we are doing is that it's not gonna be a dead end. It's just gonna be an accelerator for what you're doing. And even the scenarios that I, were, that I was talking where you can do your theming through the through browser, what, how we're imagining that to work is that you can always go back to working in code if that's the experience that you prefer. For example, you could have your less technical site builder start creating the site and when they hit some challenge, you could have a developer come help and, and extend that uh, by using code. Uh, so we're trying to build a platform where uh, users of different technical skill levels can collaborate uh, together. Put it another way, let's say we have the hypothetical example 
where you have your scrappy small nonprofit, and then you, I don't know, you get the next, like Bill and Melinda Gates, $10 billion grant. And now you're gonna develop, a, you're gonna onboard a whole internal development team and it's no longer the lonely only site builder doing everything themselves. They're not gonna have to scrap it to have a, to have a like highly sophisticated enterprise scale thing. They'll be able to work from the same code base and just keep going. Uh, yes. Just, just repeating the question is basically, is what's done in the UI of Starshot going to be exportable back to your configuration management, back to your CI process, if you have a more sophisticated um, sort of development process going on, so. Yeah, it's, it's going to support both workflows. You can either work in a single environment or you can work in the sort of multi-environment where you need to move code from development environment to staging and then production. But also, I think the question was even more if the change is made on production, can you backport it back into your like Git environment for future builds? So there's some ideas where you can export. For example, if you've built a theme within the production environment where you could export that theme and then you could take it locally and then you could commit that into a Git repository locally. Okay, still notice the word explore. <laughs> Not promise or guarantee, but um, I'm gonna go here and then here. Yeah, so I'll start with you if the first question come back for your second one. So this question is about if two recipes overlap in some way or fundamentally would conflict with each other because they want to modify the same entity that shipped with core or something like that, how is that gonna be managed? Or they're both part of some contrib ecosystem and trying to modify the same field provided by the parent. Um, how's that going to be managed? If we had Wim in the room, he would be like doing a little dance about config validation, which is a system that's being added into core to, um, and that he's been championing, championing that is basically designed to sort of, well, to validate the state of the config after these things are together and, and use some logic to decide what should win. And presumably in certain cases, present to you a, these things can't work together, and let's stop you from breaking something on the site before letting you just install that, so. Part of yeah. it also, the way that the recipes are architected, they are supposed to be declarative. So for example, if you have an SEO uh, recipe, it could tell that I want to add the meta tags field to every content type, and it doesn't specifically have to describe the content types. And that way, the recipes can kind of describe what is the intent of that recipe, and integra integrate the sort of arbitrary set of existing things in the system. Right. They can also declare dependencies on things that I need text format of this type, I, but it doesn't have to be the specific one that you, you had. Yeah. yeah, so I just wanted to add that if, if the validation works, then it's gonna be a win-win situation. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Um, you said a second part of your question, then I'm gonna go to Jess. Go, go there first. Well, Jess, go ahead. We're still exploring the, the specific ways how people will upgrade from, from existing uh, tools, but that is something that is very much top of, top of our mind because it's also important from kind of the perspective of getting users to uh, start using that tool. So it is something that we are looking at the very early stage of, of the project to, to find out ways how you can run those side by side, maybe migrate content like one by one where a content author would say that I want to move this uh, piece of content to the experience builder and they can then kind of see if that looks how they would expect it to look like and then make a decision if they proceed with that or not. So there's different ways that we are 
um, looking into moving towards the new experience builder, and that's something that we're going to give more messaging later once we've uh, defined it. And I think that would be great feedback to put in the experience builder sort of project issue um, area because, for example, there's probably folks out there who are using paragraphs for layout right now, and so that's a different kind of upgrade path question. There's multiple, multiple existing solutions. Um, but I think, yeah, what Laurie's saying, the, the idea of hopefully it'll be functional in parallel so you could go either content by content or content type by type, yeah. maybe how it winds up. Yeah. And, and, and that was an experience builder specific answer. So the rest of Starshot is going to be other contributed projects. So if you're using those contributed projects, then you will get their respective updates when you update those contributed projects. So it's not going to be a special Starshot version of Gen theme or a special Starshot version of something, something, but it will be the contrib version of those things. And so that's, that's what I like about Starshot is it's finally, finally understanding that people's experience of Drupal is core and a bunch of contributed projects together. And so we can think about that as a whole all together and improve all of those things. And even if those people that don't use Starshot will get the benefit of the improvement of all of those other components and core itself. So you're getting the benefit there even if you are not starting off from Starshot. Even your existing site will get those benefits. Yep. So the other question at this table. Mm. So to restate the question for the rest of the room, uh, basically, are the recipe components uninstallable? If you choose not to go down a particular path, can they be, then be replaced with a different alternative? All of those sorts of things. So we have some concepts to, that, that we're exploring where we could take a snapshot of the point before a recipe was applied, which would allow you to go to the time before the, the, conf, uh, the recipe was applied. But that obviously doesn't really work well if you applied multiple things and you want to keep some of them from those. So in the case where you just applied a recipe and you tested it out, um, it's highly likely that that's something you can go back with. But then if you've done multiple things and want to keep some of them, that's when you would have to manually then uh, figure out how to undo it. Um, in many cases, it's probably straightforward, but you might have some leftover modules or, or, or things in your site. But for example, the case of the event re recipe, that would mean that you can delete the content type and then you maybe had like um, smart date module still around in the side. And maybe it's not necessarily a big problem that the smart date module is installed on site even though you're not using it. Yeah, the way I think about recipes uh, is that it, ought, so the, way, the reason I say the exact words of it automates site building steps is because if you do site building steps, then you will need to undo them in a way that, that makes sense for you. So it, it's, a, it's a robot that comes in and does those site building steps. And um, I think this uh, cuts down the, the curve of figuring out how to do those things to be much faster. I think that's already a big improvement. If it doesn't provide you uh, an upgrade path or if it doesn't provide you a way to roll it back or those things, they are still not features that are available with your manually building a site. So we're not taking away anything that was there before. We are giving you an acceleration to get to a point faster. And if we can solve the other problems, even better. But if we can't solve the other problems, we are still giving you more value than we did before. So there's That's the idea. Another related concept that I just want to mention as an idea, maybe someone wants to explore it, which is uninstaller recipes. So you could theoretically have an un uninstaller for a recipe because Basically, it is, again, it's just automating steps that the site builder would take. So then you write a recipe that would do those steps to uninstall a specific recipe. I suspect we'll see an experiment with that from one of the recipe maintainers <laughs> in the next three months. Okay, we got a bunch. I'm trying to think. Let's go here. Yes.
this is a this is an interesting question. I'll try and tackle this one actually because I think it comes to the DA and Drupal.org side as much as anything else. Which was, so the question is, will there be organizations that support people starting on Starshot effectively in some form, or will we be recommendation recommending organizations that explicitly support that? And I think the again going back a little bit to what Gabor is saying, because what Starshot is doing is automating a lot of initial site building steps, I think most of the quality Drupal vendors that are already out there are able to support this kind of situation. Now, some of them will say, they'll look at your use case and say, you know, actually we have an internal recipe. That what, what's, what's actually true is a lot of these organizations basically have something like Starshot already that is their own version that they often use for onboarding and deploying uh, like a category of customer, all their higher ed customers or something like that. So there's, and so a lot of them will be prepared to do that and a lot of them may have their own thinking about how we're like, cool, it's super awesome that you've actually made the prototype for us instead of us coming into a pitch meeting to make a prototype for you. Um, but here's some things that we know from our experience we wanna transition to you to when, when you're actually going for your full production thing. So I suspect it's going to work that way. Um, obviously, Drupal.org already offers the certified partner marketplace, and those folks are going to be good at this. Whether there's going to be a specific designation related to Starshot, I think not, because I think it's, again, it's only, it's only doing what we actually expect everybody be, to be doing, but we don't say out loud right now. So, um, here. So yeah, the question here was, is Starshot, is the, is the kind of point of Starshot right now to provide a specific set of core recipes that will ship with core? That's, there's a slight complication to that question, but go ahead. So there's going to be a default set of recipes that ship with the Starshot um, that are in the Starshot core, but not necessarily in Drupal core itself. Uh, so that's going to be high quality vetted recipes that are designed for specific use cases. Mm -hmm. there is a, there's been a suggestion and a lot of questions about should there be eventually multiple star shots. So should there be like the Drupal CMS star shot, but should there be a nonprofit star shot, which is basically just saying, should there be some additional recipes that are more oriented towards a nonprofit use case or a higher ed use case or a government use case, right? So the, the initial set, the goal that the rocket everyone is trying to launch is the one that goes to the moon where we have Drupal CMS features, but uh, then maybe we want to go to Titan. Uh, I don't know, where do nonprofits live? Um, <laughs> one, one of these heavenly bodies, we'll figure. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Very good. Okay, question here I think was waiting. Again, I'll, I'll repeat for the room, when Experience Builder exists and you have sort of design in the browser instead of design in Twig or something like that, is the output of that that's being created the same kind of thing? Is it making Twig files or s creating CSS or all these sorts of things? Uh, so Experience Builder will be storing those modifications in the database as, as configuration or similar type of format, but we pro provide a way for a builder persona to, to then export that either as config or as code in the code base. So for example, if you are creating a component through the experience builder, uh, by default, it would be exported within your, uh, your configuration export, but then you could explicitly say that I, I want to get this component as code, and then you get some Twig, CSS, and, and YAML as part of that, and then you can edit it just like any SDC component. Uh, hold on, so many. <laughs> I think you may have been waiting longer, so I'm gonna try. Um, in the long term, are recipes supposed to replace profiles entirely, or do profiles change? This is a good question. Do recipes replace what are currently installed profiles? I think so, yeah. So the, so the ultimate goal of Starshot is that all of the infrastructure for Starshot will get into Drupal core. And then the initial screen of Drupal core, no, not the initial, after you select the language, then the screen of Drupal core where you select the profile 
will be a selection of uh, baseline recipes like start like Drupal CMS and some other baseline recipes. And so you will not select install profiles. The recipes are a lot more flexible, as Tim said, because they don't lock you in. They can be combined with each other, unlike install profiles. They can inherit from each other, unlike install profiles. So we're solving a lot of the problems that we've seen with install profiles in recipes, additionally to being it more widely usable. Um, no, not really. I mean, it's, there's still some development going on on the recipes concept, but there are folks who've already built recipes, already experimenting with using them. Yeah, that's... So the main blocker with that would be that there might not be recipe actions for everything that you can express within an install profile today. Um, so that could be a blocker for that, but those can be created, and then if you create them, then you can express it as a recipe. There's one use case which is not necessarily covered by recipes that is covered by the install profile, where you can provide a central, centrally managed uh, distribution uh, where the configuration updates are managed by the install profile itself. And that is something that you can't do with recipes today. So there are still some use cases for, for install profiles going forward, but use cases like the standard or, or umami, what we have in Drupal core, is going to be replaced by recipes. Yeah, for the question of whether you can use it, I uh, just discussed with uh, Chris Wells from Redfin in the room next door. And he's he was like, yeah, we've already been using recipes for a year. All of our internal stuff is recipes. We have these bunch of recipes for our customers. So you can pop into the recipe Slack channel and ask about who's, who has this experience. And several of the people on the team have been using it in, with Clarion Plajax for, for a while. That, the good thing about it for for... So the reason that they could use this, even though it was just added to Drupal core last week, is that recipes done, the recipes infrastructure is not needed to be on the live environment because it's just about building out the site. So they could use it on their development environment and then push out the result of the recipe to the live environment. So they were using this for a long time now, some of the companies already um, in their dev processes. So it's well tested. Yeah. A lot of the folks who've been contributing to it. Okay, here, you've been waiting. Uh, and by distribution model for community, so what is the wit mechanism by which we share community created recipes? Yeah, that's a really good question. There's some work to do on 